let's start recording. All right, uh, welcome everybody. This is the ArcGIS Parcel Fabric Workshop for mm -hmm. September. It's September 13th, about 3.13 in the afternoon. <clears throat> we got a little bit September late September 17th. Excuse me, 17th. Let me catch my breath again. We got a little bit of late start because of uh, some confusion on the links to actually join the meeting. So I apologize again to everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, so um, we have here, Nancy Von Meyer is here. <clears throat> um, and Nancy, you've got to leave at 3 by 3.30, right? Yeah, I do yeah. today, but I just want to see, see everybody and say, hey. Good, good. We're so glad that you stopped in. Um, we really are, and we're thankful for that. Yeah. yeah. So we are still there. You know, uh, by the way, I see you've got your parcel fabric shirt on. I was going to just comment on it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that, that, um, those are collectibles. I don't know what that is associated <laughs> with them anymore, but they are collectibles. That is from the arc map parcel fabric, yeah. Um, and and hopefully someday there will be another conference in which Esri will give away some new ArcGIS parcel fabric merch out. That would be nice. That would be nice. So um, today, this workshop, what we're going to do is we're going to just sort of go over some basic um, workflows to do simple things such as a merge. A meets and bounds description, and then an aliquot split. Um, just those three simple things, and and um, we've got plenty of time to do that. Before we start, I wanted to open up and see: Does anybody have any questions or anything they want to talk about before we get in there? Especially since we now have Nancy here. Nancy, I know you're doing, you're rewriting your book, right? You're you're adding new content to your book. Is that correct? I am. I, I had I had a little bit of a bump. Uh, kind of slowed me down a little bit. Hit a speed bump, but uh, I feel like I'm kind of back at it again. So I'm refreshed and getting back at it. So I'm going to try to get the PLSS section banged out. So I'm anxious to see on the splitting, uh, the out splitting the aliquot parts. And then, um, yeah, I'm hoping to have some. I had hope by the end of September, but probably more like Thanksgiving to get that text all onto the medium and then it'll have to all be reformatted and you know how that goes. Yeah, so um, on splitting of the aliquot parts, I, I'll, if you don't mind, I'll just jump ahead to that because I know you have to leave here in, in 15 minutes. So we'll go ahead and, and do that real fast and then we can go back to the others. Um, there's some tools inside the ArcGIS Pro that allow you to go and do aliquot divisions. However, we want to be careful because aliquot divisions can be defined different ways, all right? And I'm going to go and turn off my subs, and I'm going to turn off my conveyance divisions, and we're going to treat, we're going to do something on this parcel here, this one parcel, and look at it as if A, first of all, it's a simple parcel where the aliquot breakdown is basically nothing more than taking 50 feet off of this parcel. And then we'll go and we'll make a grand assumption that maybe this was a section, all right? A very oddly shaped section. But if this was a section of land, how would you go and perform an aliquot breakdown on that? Okay, so we'll do it both ways. And I'll go and I'll create a new record for it. And this is just gonna be junk because I'm going to throw it away no matter what I do. All right, just junk. So remember on every single transaction inside the, Arc map, inside the ArcGIS parcel fabric, you want, you want to have a, um, a record so that it tracks things and what goes on. So if we look at that first instance, that first case in which we're going to do an aliquot split where the aliquot split is a non-PLSS aliquot, but east or the west 50 feet of this parcel. How do we do that? It's actually very simple inside of here in that if, if it's 
somewhat rectangular or if the boundaries of this are are really simple boundaries what we could do is is as simple as again we have a record i can go and select a polygon once i have that polygon what i'm going to do is i'm going to go and pull up the divide command the divide command understands whether you are dividing a single line or whether you are dividing a polygon. In this case, since I have a polygon selected, it assumes and knows I'm going to divide a polygon. And what I'm going to do is I get I can divide it proportional areas, equal areas, or equal widths. In this case, I'm going to do equal widths. I'm going to do equal widths, and I'm going to go and take off let's just make it 100 feet here i'm going to type in 100 feet and then i can tell it from which side do i want to go and take it in this case i'm going to take it from this side all right so again i went and had a single polygon i clicked on equal width told it how wide and maybe we do make it 50 feet here 50 feet wide so it's going to be parallel to this boundary. I then click on this link here and I tell it what boundary I want to be parallel to and tell it to go ahead and divide that parcel. It then literally goes and divides that polygon, creates two new polygons. The parcel fabric, if you note it, automatically created corners parcel corners for me. If I wish, I can go in here and just say, make sure that you get a, a parcel line for that also. But literally, I have done that aliquate split. All that's left now is to go in here to my attributes and tell it which one of these gets a new parcel number. All right, and then I might go and update the acreage on here and such, but literally that's how simple it is inside of here. If, and this is a big if, if the polygon of which I wanna break has simple boundaries. If this had complex boundaries, such as this parcel to the north, I couldn't do this. If it had a curve in it, I couldn't do that. So. There's a limitation on using this technique on, on doing it. If I wanted to go and instead get, say, the north 25 feet of this parcel, so the north 25 feet would be parallel to this north line, parallel to this line here, what I could do is I'm in the same record, by the way. I could go in there and select these lines. And again, I'm going to unselect this polygon, unselect this polygon, unselect this and this. So I have those lines in here. I don't care about this. And if you'll note, these are duplicated because of they have duplicate lines in there because it came from the original ones. So here's one set of those lines. And get rid of this. Clear this out. So here's the lines that I wish it to parallel. So if it's a non-regular or non-simple boundary that I wish it to duplicate it, I use a different technique. In this case, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna go and instead of doing a modify, I'm gonna tell it to copy parallel, all right? And the copy parallel it's going to show me directions. I'm going to tell it the template I want to copy onto tax lines. And I want it to be, in this case, because this is 50 feet, let's do something smaller. Let's do 25 feet. And then I tell it on both sides or on the left side or on the right side. In this case, I want it to be on the left side. The other option is keep source attributes, everything else, I can say copy. 
it then goes and copies them. I have one thing here. I might not have deleted all of this correctly. Let's go in here and create these two lines. Was that because the uh, direction of those lines was different? Like those two lines were going that way and all the rest of the lines were going that way. Yeah, the what what that was caused by was the fact that when I, I just sort of group selected those lines and it turns out if we zoom in and look, this was an old ArcMap parcel fabric that we migrated. And the old parcel fabric had two lines, one for each adjoining parcel. And we haven't oh, deleted right. those yet, all right? So that's why okay. it had two lines there. If I had gone through and said only, you know, get rid of identical stuff, then it wouldn't have been that. The only problem with this, and let me unclear that, I now have those lines in there. The only problem is I want to make sure that they extend. Because right now, by default, that copy parallels doesn't extend. So I will do an extend trim and tell it to, I don't need a selection. So I'll go up here. And when I click on this, you'll see it actually put a line in here. And I'll say, fine, it goes and extends that line. I'm gonna go over here and tell it to go and trim that line up. All right. So I'm going to get off of this. So now I've gone, I've created the parallel lines to that boundary. All right. So again, there's a couple of techniques. The first technique is you take the polygon, if you have a simple boundary, and just parallel that edge of the polygon. If it's a more complex boundary or it has a curve in it, you have to create parallel lines you extend them and trim them so that they match. And I'm going to go now and select, well, first I'll, I'll select this polygon and then I'll do a split on the polygon. All right, that split, I have two ways of doing it. I can interactively do it or I can do it by a feature. Well, since I have already a line, I'm going to go and tell it that this polygon here, that is my target. That's what I'm going to cut. And the actual line I'm going to use is this line here. So I'm going to use this tax line. And I'll select them all. That tax line to cut this. And I will cut against that polygon. I'll, use, I'll select the lines that I'm going to use to cut it and then cut it and go ahead and do that. And it will do that split, that aliquot breakdown. Nice. All right. So real quickly, to do an aliquot split, you want to go and either take in a polygon and tell it to take something off the polygon or draw the lines that you want, extend them and trim them, and then select the polygon you want to cut with and select the lines that you want to cut it with. All right. If this, and I'm really going through this fast, if it turns out that this was a section, it's much the similar things in which I want to go and create the lines that's going to signify how this thing is going to be cut. Because we all know a section is not a square. A section is, is, is comprised of various directions going on here. And, the, and whether or not you go half or whatever is dependent upon how that section was originally broken down. So again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and I'm going to go in to my create features, Go to my lines and I'm going to draw some lines in. How I draw that line or where I draw that line is dependent upon what section this is. If this is in the north half of the top tier of sections in a township, 
they're going to be closing sections, so you have to be careful. If this is in the western half of a western tier, that's going to be closing sections. You have to be careful. But let's assume this is a normal section, one that's not a closing section. We can make an assumption, and, and Nancy's here, so I'm being real careful with the way I word this. We're just going to split this by going to the middle of each of these lines. All right. So if I look at my snapping, my snapping actually has the capability here of going to the midpoint of a line. So I'm going to turn on midpoint snapping. Now, when I go to draw my line, I can go here. I'm going over to the western boundary of this property, this polygon. And as I move it up, right now I'm snapping to the edge. As I move it up, it will show me that's the midpoint. I can then go over here. There's the midpoint of this. So I can go and say, okay, let's go back and let's go and create the midpoint here. That's the midpoint of that, that polygon face there. Oh, that isn't the same here, is it? It turns out that the midpoint is, is over in here because this is a shortened one. I don't want to do that. So I would then, I would go and then have to go and figure out, well, how big is this line and, and do a midpoint. And there's a couple ways of doing that. So let's go and stop this. I could. If I wanted to be tricky, I could say, well, okay, I understand that. Well, let me put a line in here that's that length. Now I can go here and tell it to snap here to the midpoint and then snap there to the midpoint of the line. Nice. All right. So again, I can be, it depends on how conscious I am of what I'm doing and mapping in here. I can go and do that. Let me go now and select those lines, select the lines, and I'll go to my modify, and I'll go to planarize. Planarize goes did just, in. Did you add a new line in there now, though? Are you worried about that, or was that just a construction line to find the midpoint? You have a new line in there now. All right, I do. And let me finish this. And then we'll talk about that. Okay. So I go in here and do a planarize, and there it's a planarize. And I now have four lines instead of two. There are the four lines. But I have another line in there. So if I go to my record and say select all the lines that were built as part of this, it will show me, and this is a this have record has all of this in here. And go in here and once I'm done with this I can I can just go in here and say this is the line I want and there's the line if I wish to go and delete it out but using the record it keeps track of what I created and what I deleted and if I wanted to I could just delete this All right, so I can go ahead and just delete this line if I want. So now, now that I have lines and I have the polygon that I wish to split, the section, for example, that I wish to split, I can then just go and either interactively split that polygon or I can go and do the same thing I did before, select the polygon, select the lines and say split interactively. Or, or split by features. Select that polygon. All right, go in here and do a split. Tell it to split the polygon, do it by feature, make this my target. There's my target and my input. I'm going to select these lines. Those are my input here is my target go ahead and split them 
All right. And the key to being successful with the ArcGIS parcel fabric is forgetting so much of what we learned with the ArcMap parcel fabric and going back to understanding that we can just now use simple tools. If we understand how these things are supposed to be constructed, we can use simple tools to go and build and interact with the fabric. All right, that's the key to it. And Chris will share with you, we, Chris has, has got a project in which he was just, he was inputting a subdivision and attempting to do it the way it was done in ArcMap parcel fabric. And what happened, Chris? Oh, it didn't work. <laughs> it was very frustrating. So uh, there was a bit of a learning curve when when moving into ArcGIS Pro. But I figured it out. And once you figure it out, it's it's uh, it's actually an easier workflow. So what was the workflow when you were doing a subdivision? Uh, well, I, I mean, traditionally, you go from, you know, outside in. So I'd build the subdivision boundary and then I would uh, build the road and, and then from there, you know, build the, the lots. But uh, what I ended up doing in Pro, it well, ArcGIS Fabric, is uh, I would build the subdivision boundary and then build the center line for all the roads and then do parallel offsets to that center line. and Build the rights away, then divide those right away up and connect them for the lots. So yeah. it's like going back to the future, right? We go back to those old, those old rules. This is how you build a subdivision. You go and you build the outside polygon, build, make sure the boundaries in there correctly, put all that in. And then you build the center spine or the structure, the, the skeletal structure of the center lines of the roads. And then you take those center lines and you parallel them to create the rights of way. And then you go and use, for example, the fillet tool to go and create your, your safe site corners and all of those. And once you've got all of, you then have in essence, what is the block boundaries. Then you take those and you divide them up according to the way the plat says the individual lot distances are. Now, what are the benefit of doing it that way? Is that you're not accumulating error as you are by doing it the old ArcMap way, the ArcMap parcel fabric where you did lot and add error, add error, delete error, add error, delete error. You don't get the rounding errors that you do with the ArcMap parcel fabric. So again, we're still rethinking how to do some of these things. And you actually see when I start doing some of the other ones, we're kind of figuring out what the best practices are because it is a rethinking and going back to the fundamentals of parcel mapping. How do you do parcel mapping? It is when you're doing a meets and bounds, you go and you find out if there's any sort of bearing a basis difference. You go and you input the lines. You then go and make sure that you build something, it's closed. Then you go and clip it out eventually. When you're doing aliquate, you can either use the tool to just cut something off or you then go and draw the parallel lines that you want to split it and then use the split tool to go and split your polygon. Uh, subdivisions is the same way. We're going, we're, we're constantly rethinking what is the best way because we now have this, this whole new paradigm of mapping and how do we do this in here? Um, by the way, when I'm doing these splits, these aliquot splits, notice the one thing I'm not doing is I'm not creating seeds. Because I'm not creating something new. I'm taking existing and dividing it up and splitting it up and such. So one of the benefits of this is that I don't have to create and deal with seeds and new closure lines and things like that. I'm just taking something that's existing and building from that. So Frank, if you if you were gonna like with that block boundary thing that Chris was talking about, you might want to have the blocks, but you might want to keep the blocks. So you just go and so when you want to do that, again, I'm I'm just gonna to go to um 
modify back here. We'll go back here. Um, I'm gonna take that out, sorry. And look at all my tools. So if I have the blocks defined, all I'll do is I'll say duplicate this and copy it into a block layer. Then I have my block. Oh, so, so it's a conscientious, then, conscientious keep. That's exactly right. It's a, it's it's consciously going and keeping that and and saying I'm gonna I'm gonna keep this. I'm not gonna go and edit any more on it. That's a valid block. Then let me go and build the lots off of that. So again, so if, you need, it, so if, you need, if you need to keep the parent, you do the duplicate, and then do your split on the duplicate. Yeah. So there's a question in here from Mark. How do you split and keep the parent parcel? And in 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 this case, because I've got my tax parcels, I'll actually show you my historic ones are now turned on. I actually kept parents for all of these things. So if I go in here and zoom and look at my, I have. This is my overall one before I split the the hundred feet off of it, and then this is that larger one that I split up even further. So I did keep the parents on each of these, and they are all marked with the record that was used to create it and the, the, when I actually did it here, when I actually did it, the timing and such on here. So to answer your question, Mark, it did keep them when I use that split command on it, um, it did. Then, And by the way, if I did not have an active record, it would split it and not put anything in historic. So since I have a record, it's keeping the historic parcel. That's a really good question. Thank you. All right. So Nancy, are we going to keep you here, or are you going to have to leave? I know oh, you have a meeting. Okay. You have to oh, go to. Oh, I gotta go. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, thanks very much, Frank. Good yeah. to see you guys. Thank good you see for guys. stopping by. Thank you. You guys, again. you guys take good care. Next, hope we'll see you again. Hopefully next week, maybe not, but we'll see you again. Thanks. Thank All right. You. Thanks, Frank. Have a good night, Nancy. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Good to see you. Good to see you too. All right, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to discard all this and I'm going to go back to my original presentation, which is that um, go over the merge, then go over a meets and bounds split, and then go again maybe over aliquot splits. All right. Frank, before you start, Diane has a question in the chat. She says, how are you handling the history of the record outlines? Over time, they just stack on top of each other. I'm wondering if there's a best practices yet of clipping and uh, marking the previous record boundaries as historical or just let them stack for eternity. So um, that's a really good question. Okay. And, and we want to sort, I mean, we can dig, dig really deep here. All right. So let's start by saying this, <clears throat> that the record-based workflows, doing this with a record so it marks things as historic, it only marks them historic when, in fact, we make a change to that feature. All right. So again, a record is taking and marking something as part of a record when you add something or when you modify the geometry on it. So if I were to go and and add as I as I do as I'm going to do with a meets and bounds split, I'm going to add lines. I'm going to add uh, a polygon. It creates a record and it stores those as active. And then when I do the clip, since it's going to split out the geometry of that, that parent parcel, it's gonna mark the parent parcel history and it's gonna mark the parent lines history because I've changed the geometry on them. And, and that's, that's sort of a nuance you wanna understand is that it only marks something with a record if it's used for, I gotta be careful, if it adds something or 
if it modifies the geometry of it. Okay. So if I go in here and take this and I do a split on it by just drawing a line, it's going to mark the polygon as historic. It's going to mark the new line that I create as a part of a record because it's a new thing. But since I'm not deleting or modifying these lines, it doesn't mark them historic. It keeps them still. It's only when you change the geometry on those that it marks them as historic. So Diane, getting back to your question, if I'm reading into it what I think I'm reading, the historic lines don't really stack up on top of another unless you cut them and then cut them again and then cut them again with different records. Then they stack up to one another. But when they're stacking, then each of them goes and is associated with the record that was used to create them, to split them. Is it still clear as mud on this or did I clear it up just a little bit? The record and marking things historic, it only changes. So you're talking about the record outlines. Okay, the record outlines. So just to clarify, so the records here are a set of polygons. Let me go and turn them on. All right. Let me turn on my polygons here, my records. These are records. As you create and use a record-driven workflow, it goes and stacks records on them. This may be heresy, but I'm telling you that right now our thought is that you never really pay attention to the records. They're just there, they're used as a reference and relate things back and forth, but you should not be depending upon record outlines for anything. They're more a way to associate the things that you are tracking, the polygons and the lines of the parcels, the lots, the subdivisions, those sorts of things. And not so much, you, you really don't pay attention to the records. They are, they are more of, of um, wow, my mind just went blank, more of a gazetteer function. A gazetteer function, a gazetteer is something that points you to something else. And that's what the records are. They are things that point you to what was created and what was deleted as part of this transaction. All right. So the record outline, not the lines of the parcels. So the record outline, again, is basically just the outline of the overall gazetteer and everything that we are preaching to everybody is don't pay attention to them. Matter of fact, don't even keep them on. You really don't need to see them. You don't need to have them on there unless you have some sort of some special work that you're trying to do. If you have your records that are marked with for example, whether or not you need to investigate this further or not investigate them further. But the record outlines are extremely dynamic. Every time you go into a build or your extent or build, if I go into a build extent or, or build parcel fabric, it rebuilds those outlines so that they reflect what was part of that record. All right. I'm hoping to understand that. So, Diane, have you are you thinking that you'll be paying more attention to the records and the record outlines? Um, just waiting. Yep. Debating making them useful. Yeah, they're really not useful. They are. They are, again. It's a it's a gazetteer type function. It's a way to have a related table. But it's a related table. It's a related table that works with web services more than anything else. And I think that's the reason why. See the the reason why um, they're put in like that. 
Now, the question you have is see what was the most current record area. Um, you can, this, because a record is really nothing more than a simple feature class, if we go over here to our database and go down here, we can actually see that this is the actual records. And if I go in and add that to my map, you'll see a polygon feature class come in and it's all colored. And if I open up the attribute tables in here, these are just polygons. That's all they are. It's a polygon feature class, but it's utilized by the parcel fabric to mainly just keep track of what was related to what and how it came in. So if you want to, you could always go and pull those records in, set a, set a definition query against them or symbology against them and say, oh, okay, only show me the most current ones or show me ones that match a certain element on here. So show me, you know, what's the most current one on here, that sort of thing. You could do that if you wanted to, but records as a whole, they're, they're, they're not completely useless, but they have minimal use, minimal application inside the, the parcel fabric as it stands right now. Again, it was a useful tool for the developers to be able to go and relate things with web services because they it's a it's harder to relate it with a table than to relate it with a feature class. All right. So let's go back. So what happens when the ultimate lot boundary remains unchanged, but the tax parcel is split? There's only one set of lines. Um, oh, we're getting into some really deep discussions here because yes, the reality is that um, lines inside the parcel fabric, there's two different ways to have lines. The first way is in which you have a set of lines which is ultimately associated with one parcel, all right? And that's the way the old ArcMap parcel fabric worked. And that's sort of the way most people would think about lines associated with tax parcels. They, all, they each stand on their own. They should only have one line on them. And that line goes to that parcel because that was part of a description and those lines go with that description. But because you also have not just tax parcels, but you have lots. Well, within lots, a lot is what they call a simultaneous conveyance division. You go and take a single polygon and you divide it up in that division, there's only one line. And that's the one line dividing one lot from the other one. So, in the case of a tax parcel where you have lines associated with a polygon, that's called overlapping lines. And as you're building tax parcels, you will create these overlapping lines that are associated with the individual records. But as it relates to lots and the public land survey system, if you're in a rectangular system there, you will only have, you should have one line dividing between two different lots because the lots and the PLSS are actually derived from drawings in which you only have one line separating the two, the two lots or splitting a section or one line between two sections. So in that case, you will have shared boundary lines. Within the parcel fabric, there's both models. There are shared boundary lines, and then there's overlapping boundary lines. And depending upon how you build this, it will give you both. But it depends upon where your data comes from as far as whether or not by default initially you have both or not. Usually what we do is when we go and migrate from ArcMap, we'll take the lot lines and we will delete identicals. Identicals having the same shape and the same distance on them. So you only have one line between two lot polygons. 
again, remember that the lots have their own sets of lines. The tax parcels have their own set of lines. The sections have their own sets of lines, quarter sections, subdivisions. They all have their own set, set of lines now because they go with those polygons that are in there. So usually the lots, the PLSS, will go through and we'll clean them up and which will delete identical lines. So you'll wind up with just shared lines on those layers. And on the other layers, you'll have overlapping lines on them. Does that, does that answer your question? Well, I was just wondering historically, so what happens if, um, let's say a lot of a subdivision split and now it's a new tax parcel of two tax keys, but that same lot boundary stays the same. Ah, uh, okay. Let's make sure that we- I don't want, you were saying that everything goes historic once you modify those lines. Well, are the lot lines going to go historic then? They aren't technically historic. Correct, because we want to make sure that we want to make sure we think of this correctly. When we are taking and mapping a tax parcel that's related to portions of a lot, we are not dividing up the lot. We are dividing up, we are not dividing up, let me turn these on. We are not dividing up the lot. We are dividing a set of polygons on top of those lots. The lot polygons, are basically reference layers. They will tell us what the original lot configurations and what the original partitions and divisions were. We rarely split a lot polygon, unless there's a subdivision replat or something. We would rarely right, go right. and do that. So make sure you understand that terminology that we're not gonna split lots. We're gonna split tax polygons on top of them. So it's the tax so line. They're all sharing the same lines. Oh, they're not. They're, they're not. not. Okay. They're not. Those because remember, the lines are separate. You have lines here for your taxes, and then lines for your lots. They are not sharing those same lines in there. Okay. Yeah. Good question. I thinking, I, well, yeah. yeah. I mean, I was thinking you said do delete all the duplicate lines. Well, it's not deleting from each right. feature right still it, independent of itself okay it's it's deleting the duplicate lines that were caused with the arc map parcel fabric okay it's those lines are are more efficient now and that they only they reflect that there was only one line between two lots but the tax parcels on top of them may have had two lines on them it, right it, it okay. may have also had one line it depends upon how they were originally defined. Right. So that does work that way. Okay. 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 So. Okay. Good question. So, uh, I mean, you went, you all went a lot deeper than I thought we were going to do right away, but that's okay. These are, these are good questions. All right. So let's go back to the merge. All right. So the request that we have in front of us is that this par parcel and this parcel you know, the owner of this parcel of land purchased this one and he wants to merge them together. So what we do is we will create a new record. All right. And I'm going to call this merge demo. And I can just tell it that this is a combine. And by the way, the only thing that's required is a name field here. But I'm just going to create those. And I now have a record. So it will, because it has a record, it will keep track of history. It will do a whole bunch of things for me. But I now have a record. So my merge is actually as simple as selecting my two polygons here and clicking and saying merge these two. Simple, just merge these two. Now, say which, so the merge, while it appears to be simple, there is complexity built into it. Because if you use the ArcMap parcel fabric, you remember there are all kinds of options. Do you want to delete your parents? Do you want to keep your parents? 
Do you want to go merge them and put them on a different template? All of that. And you have those same options here. By default, if I wish to take my two parcels, make them one, and then take my two parcels and mark them historic, I would use merge them into a new parcel. I would select the parcel that I want to keep as the parent attribution. And I could say, keep my original ones. I don't want to delete the original two. I want to keep them, mark them historic. And then I can tell it whether I want to use a template or not. This use a template, I'll show you how that's used here in a minute. But right now, most times, if you're doing a transaction where it's a, a combine, you don't use that use templates. And now I'm going to say merge it. It's going to merge it. And notice it automatically created the historic parcel and the line that divided them, that is now marked historic. Because remember, the record keeps tracks of new things that we created and things that we deleted. All right. So I now have a single parcel. That's the, the merge of the two. And the record, I've, I'm calculating the record here. It automatically stores that, that record on there. Simple, simple process. It's probably the easiest thing that we can do is a merge. Any questions on that? Because we can get real complicated right now. So let's say instead of a merge that's caused by a transaction, we have a sliver of land that exists between two parcels. And we want to go and merge that into another one. We would use this same merge tool, but the actual workflow would be a little bit different. So by the way, this is a fairly good data set. So I'm going to say, let's assume that this is a sliver and this is the parcel that it's supposed to go to. How do we do this? Well, we can take these two, and if I go back to merge, if I tell it to merge it into an existing parcel instead of a new one, it will not create history. And I can tell it which one I want to go to, go to that one. To enforce that it doesn't even track this, I can turn off my record. Now we'll go and merge the two together. All right, notice it did nothing with the lines. It didn't do anything for those lines because I'm not tracking this with a record. So I would still have to go in and clean this up and get rid of those lines in here and delete them to clean it up, but it would clean up. So this is more of a quality driven workflow in which I'm cleaning things up. I'm getting rid of, of gaps. I'm getting rid of slivers on there. I can use the merge for that. One more thing that I want to do, and let's go through all this. All right. Let's say that I have in here a set of lots and I don't have a subdivision, but this is actually a subdivision here that I want to go and create. What I can do, I'm going to turn off my tax parcels. I'm going to go in here and select my parcels, all right, so that now I have these four polygons in here. I can merge them now and say, take these four parcels. Let's expand this a little bit. Let's, let's show you how this really can work. Let's say, take all of these, including this street here, and say, let's merge this. But this time, let's go and make this a subdivision. And make this Bob's Paradise. 
all right? So it'll be a subdivision. So what this is going to do is going to take all those polygons and it's going to create a new feature for me. If I wish to track this and make this part of a record, I could create a record here and call this Bob's Paradise. All right, so now let me go back to the merge. I'm gonna merge it into a new feature, Bob's Paradise, merge into a new feature. I'm gonna make a subdivision. Bob's Paradise. All right, here it is here. Merge it in, and now I have Bob's Paradise that fast. All right, so that merge tool can be used a lot of different ways. It can be used for going and recording a transaction where two adjacent parcels are merged together or even two non-adjacent parcels are merged together into a multi-part polygon. Or it can be used to clean up slivers and merge them together by not creating a record. Or that merge tool can be used to create aggregate polygons. For example, if you wanna go back and build subdivision polys that you didn't have before, you can go and build them. So I had a question this morning where somebody said, well, this is good, Frank, except this subdivision actually is supposed to go to the center line of that road to the east. How do you do that? Because we know that's a real pain in ArcMap parcel fabric. So I said, well, okay, I can understand that. So here's what you do. You go in here and you do a reshape of this polygon in which you go in here and I'm just gonna do this real quickly. I'm gonna say here, to here, to here, to here, there's your new polygon for you of your subdivision boundary. All right, you wanna make sure, build the record, so, Diane, the record polygon is updated to reflect these new aggregation of the lines and such created in there. And we have new geometry for this record now. Any questions on the merge? Any comments on this? It's a little bit easier than it used to be in ArcMap, if you understand these tools. None? Okay. So let me go to my next area. And I wanted to show you this here, especially. So in here, I have a legal description. This legal description basically says, commence at this southeast quarter of a section, then for then run along the, the southern boundary, 22.42 feet to the point of beginning, then continue for 119 feet, then north, and then west, and then south, and then east to the point of beginning for an acre. Simple, simple um, legal description. I'm actually gonna go and pull it up on my other screen so I can see it a little bit better. And I, we don't have that in front of you all the time. All right. I probably should have had that set up already. All right, so I'm gonna hide this away now. And I'm gonna tell you. So again, the workflow is I'm gonna go create a record, but then I'm gonna do something different here. I'm gonna go and recognize, I've already laid this out and I know that that bearing that it actually references is not the bearing of the south line of there. So how do we handle 
when in fact we have a different basis of bearing so that it doesn't follow it. I want to show you how to do that. Sorry. Okay, so I'm going to start by creating a new record. All right, I'm going to call this meets and bounds. There's a meets and bounds split created. All right. Okay, by the way, I called it mets and bounds. I don't want to go and do that. Let's go in. How do I? Modify this, I go over to my properties and I say, no, it's supposed to be meets and bounds instead. Right, there it is, meets and bounds. All right, so I've created a record. Now I want to go and input this traverse. The first thing it says is a point of commencement going to a point of beginning. So Normally I would say, okay, well, let's start a traverse. I'm not going to do that yet because I know this south line doesn't have the same bearing as what it says on the deed. So I'm going to set the bearing basis. In order to do that, there's actually a, a command here called ground to grid correction. We, I click on this. Let me go and click on this and say, let's do this. What was the bearing that the legal description called out? It turns out that it called out 87 degrees, 45 minutes, 25 seconds, and that's in northeast direction. All right, and I'm going to click next. And now it says, show me the line that's supposed to be that bearing. In this case, it's this line. I don't have to click on the corners. I just set my correction. Now, notice that box is blue. When the box is blue, it's telling me that every line, every bearing that I input, it's going to add, not decimal degrees, come on, degrees, minutes, and seconds. It's going to add three minutes and 31 seconds too. If this was also scaled, I could also input that scale on there. But in this case, it's now going to go and put that every time. So my first, my first course is a connection line. It is from the point of commencement to my point of beginning. And note, if I have my curve, if I have my bearing basis on here, it's going to tell me right now, it's putting a correction in. 87.4525. Northeast, 4 distance of 22.42 feet. All right. That is my point of beginning for this. So here is a place that people often get confused. Well, if I wish to now use my traverse and create a different type of line, you want to remember that the lines are all stored in different layers now, and you literally have to tell it, I want to change the layer in which I'm working in. So I have to go and say, I want a new line, but this new line is a tax line, and I can then click there and say, okay, now I'm inputting tax parcels. So it is 87, 45, 25, northeast for a distance of 119.48 feet. All right. Then my next bearing is, excuse me for looking over here, north 00, 2619. And that is northwest. So it's the fourth quadrant. And it's a distance of 365. 0.86 feet. All right, now let's just make sure that you can watch it. Now my next is 87.4525, 
and this is now southwest and it's a distance of 119.48 feet and then finally I go to 00 2619 southeast which is the second quadrant 365.86 feet and it then will tell me whether or not this closes what the closure is and what the calculated area is by the way this calculated area comes off of whatever units i have set in this case it's square feet instead of acreage i could have changed that but there it is so on here a couple things with the traverse you can set optionally by clicking on this options here how close you have to be for it to go and automatically close in this case it's one foot on here you can also if you look i can export out this traverse file into an arcmap traverse file format i could also input or import that same one on there in this case i'm i'm done i don't need to do any of them so i can get off of the traverse pane I'm also, as a reminder, going to turn off my bearing rotations. All right. Now, if I look, because I went and put that bearing rotation in here, if I look, that point is on that line already. So I shouldn't have any problems by having to do alignments on it. All right. Drawing the lines. To verify that I've drawn the lines, I can go here to my, my hub and say, show me all of the lines that were parted, that were created as part of this record. Again, all I'm doing is selecting those records. I do not need to select them, just to let you know. Um, matter of fact, I'm going to unselect them. But the reason I'm doing that is, is to reinforce that creating a seed it only looks at the lines that are part of this record to create a seed and that's often a stumbling point is that well people will say well i created these lines and it's not creating a seed if i go in here and say well let's get, create some lines here and i want my parcel to be here here and there's my parcels i want to i want a parcel there and i go to create seeds it will create this seed but it will not create this one because there is no line connecting them on there you want to be aware of that that it only looks for creating seeds it only looks at those lines that were created as part of this record now, I, I, do you mind if I interject here? No, please. If, if you are planning on building multiple polygons within a pre-existing polygon, couldn't you select the pre-existing polygon, say copy lines too, that way you can utilize the pre-existing pre boundary? Yep. Yeah, you can. That's the same thing. But again, with this, it, it's a simple brand new meets and bounds putting on top of something else and you want to split because it probably has different bearing rotations on it and things like that so you could if you were building inside of here just do a copy lines to select that record say copy lines to right your new record go there yeah all right good question good question so let me create the seed i've created a seed now again a seed is the beginning of a polygon it's not the full polygon yet and when we say build it will take that polygon and expand it out. And it will build this polygon. I now have, if I look at my attributes, I have a full polygon here. I can put the property ID on here. I don't know what it is on here and say enter. In this case, I have it set up to automatically calculate the deed acreage and the calculated acreage for me. So I, in all essence, I, I could be done right now. 
except I have to clip this, don't I? Well, again, if I, if I did not do that bearing rotation to make sure it was exactly on that line, I would be doing an alignment to make sure it goes and joins it and puts it in the right place and aligns it correctly. I'm not going to do that here. So now I can Frank, go with Mark, just... Mark has a question. Yeah. So what happens if the legal deed assumes a 90 degree angle between the south and west line while the actual angle using control points is 87 degrees? We would need to account for correction on the south line and the west line. Yeah, and that actually, and that, that's a good point. Um, it was, it's at that point that you would do an alignment. You would do an align parcels on here, all right? In which you would tell it, that tell it whether or not to take the old things and adjust them to the new or take the new thing and adjust it to the old. Unfortunately, this one doesn't have it because it's not adjoining something else. This is a cutout in the middle, but I do have a, an, a, a sample for that that maybe I'll do next, next month to go and show you how to do that, but it does provide you with that capability to go in and tell it which way to go and move this. All right, good question, good question. So now that I've got this, I can do a clip. Now this is one of those things in which, um, and I've talked to, to some of the ESRI guys about this. There's two ways of doing this. I'm a surveyor, I like to keep things simple, all right? Down here is a clip of the editable features. And if I keep that checked, it will go and automatically clip anything that is turned on and editable. So because I like to do things simply, I could say, okay, well, let's turn off our subdivision layer and make sure our PLSS is turned off. Um, confidential layers, we don't have any in here, but make sure that's all turned off. So it only working on one layer, and I can tell it to go ahead and clip it. <clears throat> and it will clip out all the other layers. The other way of doing things is if I go in here and go to clip again, if I uncheck this, it works the way that split worked, in which I have to tell it, what am I going to use to cut this out? And then what am I going to cut against? And this is this looks simple, but when you go and say, well, what's your target features? If I look, suddenly it's, okay, the fabrics, I've got to tell which one, parcel line, the tax parcel lines, the connection lines, all those things that it's going to evaluate. This is sort of like parcel remainder, in which it would look at everything that's turned on. And if it was selectable and editable, it would list it there. In this case, then you have to go through and say, well, I don't want to clip that. I don't want to clip that. I don't want to clip that. It's easier. Again, so much easier if you just say, hey, just turn off your other layers and say, just clip whatever you can on this layer that I'm working on. All right. And there's the clip. So just to, to show on here, this is my historic parcel. This is my, my current parcel here. So there's the current parcel here. So let's go to attributes here. Here's my new parcel. And by the way, the new parcel has no attribution on it. None. We're hoping to be able to convince uh, the developers to automatically have us have that option to go and do that. But this is the historic. So the way that we work it is that we just go and make sure the historic is turned on, copy and paste that, and paste it here. If it turns out that there's more attribution rather than just clicking here and clipping clicking this attribute we'll go and we'll say copy 
everything on this record and paste it into this record. And it will paste the map sheet, the lat, long, all the legacy code, all this other information in there also. All right, and then we can turn off historic and there is our new parcels. I still, by the way, have to go and attribute this. So that is a meets and bounds split using corrections so that we do what used to be called ground to grid corrections or basis of bearing corrections so that we actually rotate in here and put that in place. Uh, and using the traverse, creating a, a an origin connection line and creating the actual traverse line. Do we have any questions? Do we have any comments? As I mentioned to, to Nancy in that discussion there, what we're discovering is that the best practice here is going back to the fundamentals and mapping it using those fundamentals. How do you break something down? You draw a line. How do you go in and create a subdivision? You do it from the outside in, but you draw the center line, then do the rights of way, then build everything that way. No? Nothing right now. Nothing, okay. So with that, we're about five minutes away from 4.30. Um, do we have anything else to talk about with that? I do have some other meets and bounds splits, including some that have curves on them. We're not gonna cover them in, in a half hour or even 20 minutes. So I'll hold those off until next time. The um, Are there any questions again on the aliquid splits? And how those work. I'm sorry, we kind of moved that around as far as the order of those. No? Guess not. Okay, everything's good. Thank you, Diane. All right, so with that, I'm going to end this workshop and remind you that next week is our deep dive workshop. I will make sure I send out again a simple link for everybody so they can get in here. Sorry about that. I'm learning. Um, I will send that out. Next week's deep dive is going and setting up Parcel Drafter in ArcGIS Online and having it work with the ArcMap, or excuse me, the ArcGIS parcel fabric. How do you integrate those things that are coming from Parcel Drafter and get them working within this parcel fabric? So hopefully you all will show up for that. All right, I'm gonna stop the recording and... Thanks for attending, and we hope you enjoyed this workshop. If you have questions, would like some more details about anything we discussed during this workshop, or if you or anyone at your organization would like information about training, support, or ways in which we can help you with your GIS needs, please contact me at frank at pandaconsulting.com or call me at 561-691-3277 and we can discuss how we can help you with your needs.